So hi guys, so welcome to my favorite section and that is the calculus and we can credit Isaac Newton and Leibniz with the discovery of the calculus as applied to mechanics, especially in the early days. Oh, look at these cool hairstyles. Can you imagine them on Jay-Z or Eminem? Wow, amazing. So yeah, the derivative and why is it important and why we need to study it. So let's take a quick look. So we're all familiar with the, the straight line and the gradient associated with it. I mean, we've been introduced uh, to this sort of concept, I think, as early as grade R, depending on what school you went to. <laughs> well, the straight line, and they always told you that the slope, you know, the drop or rise of this, of this graph is given by uh, y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1, which is nothing more than the change in y over the change in x. If you take two neighboring points say, yeah, as we pointed out, A and B. So it's pretty straightforward and we all know how to calculate this and the gradient can be positive. And you see the graph here with a positive gradient. You can also have a gradient being negative or the slope of the graph. So the big question is, what if it's not a straight line? How do we work out the gradient then? And before we go on to the mathematics, uh, as a physicist, I always like to relate what I learned in mathematics to the real world. And I think in school, we don't give that enough time. And I feel that the gradient of a function is much more important than knowing the function itself. Let me just say that again. The gradient of a function is much more important than knowing the function itself. And there are some very common uh, applications. So you remember from mechanics, we've studied momentum or linear momentum. And we know that the net force acting on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum, delta P over delta T. So that's the gradient. If you look at um, Ohm's law and you look at electrical resistance as well as current flow through a conductor, the current is defined as the rate of flow of charge, right? Delta I, uh, sorry, delta Q over delta T. And later on, some of the metrics would be looking at electrodynamics and we look at motors and generators, and you know that Faraday's law of electromagnetism really is nothing more than d phi dt. So the um, induced current or potential is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux. So something interesting there. So yeah, um, so there's some really real meaning when we speak of the derivative of a function, which I'm gonna try to introduce to you now. Okay, so let's come back. We've got this parabola and we want to determine the gradient between two points in there. And there's a little point over here. So it's not straightforward as saying, you know, delta y over delta x. What does that really mean? Because you notice that the gradient is non-uniform. Not, it's not constant as one would expect from a straight line. And um, so the hint here really is that red line, you know, you think, uh, well, if you put a tangent to that curve, um, maybe we can approximate the gradient and get something called the average gradient. But then, you know, we look at this very carefully and say, well, what do we mean by tangent? We know the tangent is, you know, at a point. So we're thinking maybe these points should be sufficiently close to each other. So you get the idea? So we can approximate the gradient at a point or points close to each other uh, or in the vicinity of a point, if you're looking at a general curve like a parabola or a cubic. So let's take a closer look at what we are really saying here. Okay, so we have the curve, which is that black curve that we see there. We're just going to call it f of x. We're not going to give it any functional dependence. And we're going to look at two points here. The first one is x1, and we look at x2 sufficiently close to each other. And essentially, we could say something like x1 is equal to... Um, well, not x1, but x2, which is the further point, is x1 plus some increment, little increment, h, very much less than 1. So h is a very small number. So we can define very quickly the delta x, the difference between x1 and x2, which is x2 minus x1, which is h. So h is a very small number. So we'd say that x1 and x2 are typically very close together. Now, what are y2 and y1? Well, y2 is the y value, which is f of x2. So we just replace x by x2. But what is x2? It's f of x1 
plus h, which is the neighboring uh, y2. And what is y1? y1 is the y value. And how do we get the y value? Look at the corresponding x value, which is f of x1. So in order to get the gradient, if we try to look at this, and as delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we say that x2 approaches x1 in that limit where h tends to 0. So if we had to write down just, you know, from an ignorant point of view, a not so informed point of view, if you want to write down the gradient between the two points y2, y1, we'd most likely write something like well, m equal to y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. But what is y2? It's f of x1 plus h minus f of x1 all over what x2 minus x1 what is x2 minus x1 is h and you'll think well look at that you know it's f of x is it's not really a straight line but this animation shows that as delta x approaches zero which really means in the limit as h tends to zero we'd find that the gradient that we want the average gradient between y1 y2 approximates quite nicely to the gradient of the tangent, that blue line um, at the point x1. So as h tends to zero, that means x2 approaching x1, we can work out the gradient of that curve at the point x1. So from the average gradient between uh, x2 and x1, we'll look at something called the instantaneous gradient at the point x1, which is a really good approximation uh, of the of the gradient of the curve provided that x2 and x1 are sufficiently close. I don't even know why I'm screaming. I'm just so excited. So we want to formalize this and just keep this in mind how we got this. And please pause the video, review this, try to get an understanding because it will play a role, a major role going forward. So this aspect over here, uh, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, we can drop the labeling one. And we'll just take this a little further and keep this animation in mind because I'm going to introduce a concept of the limit as h tends to zero. Okay, folks, so from the previous slide, we got to this point, f of x plus h minus f of x over h as an average gradient. I dropped the labeling one and uh, for x1. And, uh, you know, it will be better if you look at that um, animation in the previous slide and that the slope of the graph, which we will now tag as f prime of x. You would have called it m for the straight line. But here we're looking at f prime, a general curve, is equal to, now this is something new. We've used this as part here. We're familiar with that and where that came from. But this is new. And it says LIM, the limit, the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now, please, it says h tends to zero. We know we cannot divide by zero. So we're saying that h becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. What does it mean in the graph? It means that x2 approaches x1. So in the limit as x2 approaches x1, we can write down this form for the gradient. So we define f prime of x, the gradient as h tends to zero is f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. All it's telling me, I can work on the average gradient of a curve, which is smoothly behaved, uh, continuous uh, as f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, provided that these two points, the average gradient between those, these two points are sufficiently close together, the function is well behaved, continuous, and smooth. All right, so we introduced the concept. Let us now use it to find the gradient of various functions that you'll encounter in metric.